I sang that song for more than 60 years, a song of praise to Joseph Smith, the prophet of the Restoration and founder of the LDS Church, the church I served as a bishop for five years. I knew the church was true. I was a faithful Latter-day Saint. My life has been built on certain truths, but wishing doesn't change the truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. When I finally learned the truth about the real history and doctrines of Mormonism, I realized that I was following the gospel of Joseph Smith and not the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have come to learn that many others have made a similar journey out of the bondage of religion and into an authentic relationship with Jesus. And that's what this show is all about. Courageous people who want to share their story, hoping that you, the viewer, will discover the same new life in Jesus. So if you're a Latter-day Saint who is struggling with questions or seeking a genuine encounter with the Savior, we invite you to join us tonight. We have a joyful message that we want to share with you. <clears throat> Good evening and welcome to the Ex-Mormon Files here in the heart of Salt Lake City. I'm your host, Bishop Earl, and I appreciate you spending some of your evening with us. Tonight, I'm really pleased to welcome uh, someone that many of you may know and recognize his voice for sure, and that's Andy Poland from Mesa, Arizona. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Andy, appreciate you coming up, and I hope we get sometime during this uh, conversation, I hope you get to hear Andy's laugh. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a memorable one and one we really enjoy. Uh, and I mentioned Concerned Christians. You're the general manager of yep. Concerned Christians, and he also has a website, outofmormonism.com, that you can go. And Andy has interviewed uh, several, or a couple of hundred at least, uh, people. Well, a few. Or several hours. There, there, there's of, there's been a lot of people I've talked to, yes. Uh, people who have also made this transition from Mormonism to Christianity. and. Uh, so we appreciate you coming, but you were born and raised a Latter-day Saint. Uh, born and raised LDS. Um, you know, of course, I didn't have that experience until um, we had a, a youth conference up at BYU for our stake. Uh, we went up there and uh, one of the speakers challenged us to get testimonies. And uh, How old were you then? I was 14, 14 years 14. old. So, you know, of course, I knew Joseph Smith had gotten the experience at 14. and. I just thought I well I hadn't done it and I wanted to know yeah um, if it was or not and so I you know read a few passages from the Book of Mormon that night and uh, prayed about it and I had that really good warm peaceful feeling that people talk about and um, I believe that God had told me at that point that Joseph Smith was a prophet and the Book of Mormon was the word of God yeah. Now it's interesting, I know people have told us, and you probably mm -hmm. heard the same thing, that well you left the church, you must never have had a testimony. Well, I, my problem was is that I had a testimony and I was, um, I was very zealous yeah. for Mormonism, for, I mean, I, when I, I remember being on my mission and going out and just telling people that if they could, would pray and ask God, that God would tell them that the Book of Mormon is the Word of God and that Joseph Smith was a prophet, and um, I believed it. Um, I loved the leadership. Uh, I, I loved everything that there was about Mormonism. Wow. And just a good, strong testimony. And you did, uh, did you ever think that there had been anything that would ever come along to question that? No, I didn't. <laughs> um, in fact, if I would not have had experiences in my life where those spiritual experiences lied to me, and uh, that they failed, um, I would still be a Mormon today. Uh, I just, I had no reason to doubt. I had no reason to look anywhere else. I, I didn't want to look anywhere else. I was, I was really looking forward to all the <laughs> blessings of exaltation and um, becoming a god someday. Um, you know, I, I was very much in. Wow. Uh, you know. And after your mission, it was Ohio, right? It was Ohio, yes, okay. the Columbus, Ohio mission. You come home and you get married to your... I got married to my wife, Lori. Uh, of course, that's an interesting story in itself because of a revelation I had received on my mission. Um, I, El Kikuchi had come out to our mission and he challenged us to pray and commit ourselves, create our own sacred grove. Oh. Um, and um, I wanted to do that, and so I went and I prayed that night and told God that I wanted to follow him no matter what happened. 
and just made that really strong um, commitment and I had that really good warm peaceful feeling you feel many times uh, I had felt it many times at that point and um, this uh, question came to my mind and said Andy would you follow me even if your first wife is going to die because that's what's going to happen and oh, wow. I was not expecting that at all uh, I was kind of shocked by the question but I thought well you know God didn't bring Elder Kikuchi here for uh, without a reason and yeah. so he must be preparing for me for something difficult uh, and so I, I told God that I would follow him even if my first wife was going to die. Um, but I told him I didn't want that to happen. And uh, so when I got off my mission and I started attending the singles ward and I met my wife-to-be, um, you know, and we got engaged and I didn't tell her right off the bat. I was you know. wondering if you did share I, this with I, her. No, I mean, I, I waited till it was like two weeks before we were to go through the temple because I thought, well... If she's going to be the one, uh, she'll probably be the one, even if I tell her two weeks before. So that's what I did. I told her. Wow. And, I, of course, that conversation didn't go so well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she did not like the idea that she was going to die. But I was a real smooth talker at the time. And I, how I won her over is I said, well, Lori, I, you know, I don't know when you're going to die. As far as I know, you could live a yeah. really long life. I just know that you're going to die before I do. Before I do. Okay. And so uh, she... That helped that, her. <laughs> that helped her quite a bit. And uh, so um, I was the priesthood holder. She was a good Mormon woman, and she just accepted that as coming from God, which I was very grateful for. Uh, <laughs> and we were still in the temple uh, the two weeks later. And, the Mesa uh, Temple. The Mesa it? Temple. Uh, I mean, we had, I think, what was an ideal uh, Mormon marriage. We were very, uh, both my wife and I were very much loved to share the gospel. She was a, uh, before... She was old enough to go on her own mission. She had been volunteering down at the uh, visitor center and uh, been a wow. temple guide. And so when we got married, because she hadn't, she never reached the age to to do that, um, she decided that she we would go as a couple and we would go down and, and volunteer wow. um, at the visitor center. And so that's what we did. And um, you know, uh, there's a couple years that I was in the uh, Easter pageant, and I was a oh, shepherd, yeah. and yeah. so we, you know, we were just active, involved, um, going to the temple as much as we could. We just loved wow. it. What uh, what happens in life? I I know Section 132 took a turn for you. Or well, it did. I mean, because of my background and how much I had been taught, uh, of course, I had a special revelation. I think from God telling me that one day I would practice polygamy when I was about eh, 16 or 17. Um, <laughs> and of course, I didn't. I thought I was being going to practice polygamy during the millennium. Yeah, um, that's what I always thought. And uh, so, uh, I. Um, had, it was uh, about the time that we were expecting our second child, there was a friend of my wife's family who had lost her job, lost her place to stay, and um, we had an extra room at the time. And we thought, you know, it would be the right thing to do to bring her into our house and help her get on her feet. Um, you know, she had just gotten baptized, I think, a year before into the Mormon church, and so we really wanted to cement that, yeah. you know, stronghold into Mormonism. Uh, and so we just, we invite her into our house. And um, well, as soon as she walked through our door, um, I had this really strong spiritual experience, you know, that I, you know, it was felt similar to all the other ones I'd ever had, a good, warm, peaceful feeling, but very strong. Um, I don't know how else to describe it. And um, this thought come to me that this woman walking through my door is my second wife. And that scared me, because I don't know what to think of that. I was like, why in the world <laughs> would I be receiving this now? And, um, and of course, a lot of people are offended by this part of the story. I don't know how else to tell it. Um, and I'm not trying to offend anyone. Uh, it's just that um, when you go through the temple, you make a covenant you, and you get a new name. Sure. And when she went into my house, she didn't call me by my first name. She called me by my new name everywhere oh I went. Oh, my goodness. And I didn't tell her that. I wasn't, you know, I... I was trying to figure out how could she know, and she didn't know, but she was still calling me by which, my new name. Which reinforced even the uh, fact that you were, that she was somebody special. Exactly, yeah. because she was saying that everywhere, and so I'm thinking, okay, God's trying to prove it to me, but I, I was still scared of it, and so I just said, it. well, God's going to have to make it happen if he wants it, and so um, the next day when I was helping her drive around looking for work, um, 
again, I have this really strong impression and feeling that she's supposed to be my second wife. And I think at this point that I'm that this is inappropriate. God should not be telling me now while I'm in the car no. driving her around. And so I'm I'm having an argument with God in the car in my mind. Um, and telling him, you shouldn't be telling me this now. What in yeah. the heck? I mean, this is absolutely the wrong time. Yeah. And uh, so while I'm having this argument in my mind, um, <coughs> she speaks out of her mouth of how she feels like she's supposed to be my second wife. Uh, yeah. And that's exa that, no, that's exactly what I did. I yeah, just went, like, what? <laughs> <laughs> how in the world? Uh, and so... Um, Again, we, some more good feelings. Uh, yeah, I and I mean, so uh, we took that as a sign from God that we were supposed to be together. And, of course, I was so afraid uh, to tell Lori what had happened um, because of the God revealing this polygamy directly to me like this. I didn't tell her. And, of course, I knew Joseph hadn't done that growing up. I, I knew enough He didn't of, tell Emma. He did didn't he? tell Emma. And, <laughs> and so I thought I was well within my rights not to tell Lori uh, because Joseph didn't tell Emma. Um, oh and uh, and so the I'm trying to figure out though why would God do this in a time when we're not supposed to be practicing polygamy? You know, yeah. it's against the law. And uh, and then I had this revelation uh, that the reason why all of this was happening is that my, Lori was going to die in childbirth, and so I was going to have one wife in the celestial oh. kingdom and I have one wife here on earth, and that's how God was going to make everything all right. Okay. So time comes for Lori to deliver, and uh, we go into the hospital, and I'm not looking forward to this. I think everything think terrible gonna, is going to happen. No. She's going to die, and I didn't know if I was going to have my child or not, if he was going to die too, uh, you know, so I was just scared. Yeah. Um, and so we get into the hospital, and uh, everything goes wrong. Um, she oh. delivers a healthy baby boy. Oh, everything goes wrong. And uh, she she's <laughs> doesn't, she doesn't die. I know. Well, I, that was the worst for okay. me at that time because I was expecting her to die. Good healthy child oh. and a good healthy wife. And so I have a good healthy child. I have a good healthy wife. But now I have this problem. Yes, you do. Because God told me she's supposed to be dead and she's not. And so I don't know what to do with this. And I'm I'm walking down the the hall. And I had this thought come to me said, Andy, you're a false prophet. Your prophecy didn't come to pass. Oh, my goodness. And I said, yeah, you're right. And so I went to my wife, Lori, and I told her everything that had happened and uh, about the adultery. And um, I told her uh, that I was going to make it right. I was going to go to the church and repent. And uh, I asked for her to forgive me, and I told her that she didn't have to because I had screwed up and made a, a terrible mistake. Yeah. And I went back to my house, and I kicked the other woman out of my house, and I told her that we had been deceived. And I went to the church so that I could make it right. But there was this problem um, that my bishops and my state presidents couldn't solve for me. Had two identical feelings. One, when I was 14, that told me that Joseph Smith was a prophet, and these others that I knew were not from God. But so, the same feelings. But the same feelings. Yeah. So what do I do? How do I know what's from God and how do I know what's from the devil so I'm never deceived again? Yeah. Uh, and um, there just wasn't any verse that they could share. No. Um, they didn't have anything and uh, the best that they could tell me was if I just kept reading the Book of Mormon that God <laughs> would somehow uh, reveal that to me and, um, and so I, I just took them at their word and, um, and of course I expected to be uh, excommunicated uh, sure. uh, I had committed that the worst sin right next to murder. Yeah. Um, and so I expected to, you know, have to start all over again. And um, I was really surprised on the day when I went through and was disfellowshipped instead. Okay. Um, and uh, I worked for the next two years uh, trying to get my uh, temple recommend back, and finally I got it back. But during those two years, I was looking everywhere for my answer just so I could figure out so I never had uh, me being led astray again. He's trying to figure out these feelings. Uh, yeah, trying to figure out these feelings. And I was so frightened at the time to seek answers because I knew that my feelings could lie to me. Yeah. Um, and so that was very difficult. But I just, I just kept searching, you know, because I knew that God could work through. I knew that there were supernatural things that had happened. I knew for sure that there was a devil. Yeah. Um, I just didn't know how to find God. <laughs> and... Um, 
And so I uh, kept looking and I thought, well, maybe when I get my temple recommend back, God will meet sure. me there. Yeah. And um, it was the first time that I'd ever entered the temple where the temple felt empty to me. Um, I felt like I was an enemy in God's temple. That's the best way I could describe oh it. Oh, okay. You were still being punished. Yeah, that I was still being punished. Sure. And um, but I kept faithfully attending and looking for answers, and uh, paying my tithing, doing everything I'm supposed to do, fulfilling my callings, um, just trying to find you know what's the right answer. And I thought, you know, I'll go to my dad because my dad's a former bishop. I grew okay. up as a bishop's kid. Yeah. And I thought, I'll ask him, because he'll have the answer. He has the answer for everything. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he didn't have the answer for this one. Um, and that surprised me. That was probably the worst surprise of all, is that even my dad could not help, could me, not help me. Um, wow. And so uh, four years into uh, the repentance process, I mean, I got my temple recommend back. So that took two years, and then for another two years, I'm active in the church and going through the temple and doing all that. At that four-year mark, um, I felt an alienation from both God and from the people that were at church because everybody would get up on fasted testimony meeting and they would talk about how God had told them this and God had told them that, and nobody else seemed to be confused about what came from God. I was the only one. And it was so painful to listen to oh those testimony experiences and me being empty inside that I said, you know, Lori, um, it's too difficult for me to co go to church and to listen to this. And so I'm going to stay home and you can take the kids to church without me, but I'm going to read my scriptures at home. See if I can find my answers. I mean, maybe there's just something I missed. Well, you're really struggling, um, aren't you? And uh, somehow find the answer. And uh, after two years of inactivity um, and reading the scriptures and trying to find something and still not finding anything, um, I decided that God was not going to answer my prayer. That what I had done in committing adultery have put me beyond the blood of Christ to pay for my sin. That I, you know, that sin that was next to murder, I had gone that far, and so mm. I needed to shed my own blood to pay for my own sin. Oh my goodness. And I knew I couldn't go up to the bishop and ask for, hey, I need somebody to blood atone me, because I knew they weren't doing that. Yeah. Um, but you really so felt that was the only answer. I felt that was the only answer, and so I planned out when, I planned out where. I even went so far in my planning um, to make it easy to clean up, okay? Very thoughtful. <laughs> well, I mean, I had screwed up. Nobody else had to pay for it besides me. Um, and so that's what I planned to do. And so it was at this time my brother Matt calls me up on the phone. And uh, he tells me that uh, he's having a computer party over at his house and that if I brought my computer over that we'd be able to hook him up and that we'd be able to kill each other virtually and it'd be fun. Now, the thing that's interesting about this is that my brother Matt, two years before, had left the Mormon church and had converted to biblical Christianity. And uh, I and remember... You, you knew that. Oh, I knew that. Oh. And I had lectured him several times about how he needed to come back to the church yeah. uh, and how it was wrong of... Because he loved to get all the Mormons together and throw some uh, bomb from church history in the middle <laughs> of the floor and watch everybody freak out. And I, I went in, I talked to him, and I said, Matt, that's just wrong. Yeah. You're just, you, you can't do that. That's not right. Uh, and so I thought, well, you know, I'd asked everybody else my question. Uh, nobody had the answer. I thought, I'll go and I'll talk to my brother Matt. So I went three hours early to this uh, computer party. <laughs> just a corner him in a room alone. And I told him, that, Matt, I don't know what comes from God. I don't know what comes from the devil. I don't, I, I don't know where to look. Um, I told him there's a scripture that kept returning to my mind over and over again about uh, this evil spirit that goes uh, out of a man uh, and when he, he, this evil spirit roams the whole earth looking for a place to stay and when he doesn't find it, he says, I'll go back to the place where I um, started and he comes back, he finds the man's house all in order and he finds seven other spirits worse than himself and the last state of the man is worse than the first. And I said, you know, that's me, Matt. I'm, 
I am no longer listening to those demons who led me astray, but I'm empty. I don't have God. And so I'm just waiting for them to come back and make me worse. And so hmm. is there s something that you can give me? And so my brother, uh, who's a lot smarter than I give him credit for, <laughs> Uh, he told uh, told me that I needed to read a book, um, and it was an early version of the False Prophecies of Joseph Smith by Dick Bear. Now, in that very early version, there was a letter that Dick wrote. First thing he says in the letter, can't trust your feelings, they can lie to you. And I was like, well, I know that's true. Uh, oh, can wow. you tell me anything else yeah. besides that? Uh, and then he goes on and he quotes two Bible verses that surprised me. Uh, Jeremiah 17, 9. Um, the heart is desperately, or I'm sorry, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. wicked. Who can know it? Yeah. Okay. And then he goes, Proverbs 28, 26. He that trusteth in his heart is a fool. And I was just floored that the Bible taught that your feelings could lie to you because I, I knew that, but here's the Bible teaching it. Um, and so then he goes on and he uh, says, how do you know a true prophet from a false prophet has nothing to do with the spiritual experience? but has everything to do with um, whether or not their prophecies come to pass. And then he quotes Deuteronomy 18, 19 through 22. And I'm remembering back to the fact that I had a prophecy fail and I knew that that's where oh. I had gone wrong. And it's a real simple thing if you think about it. Yeah. Um, God knows what's going to happen before it happens. And um, if you, like, someone talks to God, then that's the thing that's going to happen. Um, if it doesn't happen, they didn't talk to God. It's that simple. Yeah. Um, and so he started giving all of these prophecies that Joseph Smith gave that didn't kind of pass. And I began to realize that Joseph wasn't who he said he was. Was that shocking to that you? That was shocking to me. Yeah. And uh, of course, the next. You really have to deal with that, don't well, you? Well, for the next few months, I did nothing but study church history and understanding and of course I was using the Tanners for a guide my brother had given me his copy of his book and I didn't want to listen to anything that they had to say I figured that their commentary was evil tainted whatever I just wanted to know what they were claiming and and so I would look it up just as a reference just as a reference I would look it up I would see if it was in context and if it was good then I would um, uh, share it with my wife because I wanted her to know what I was finding um, after doing that for three months, I just wanted to know if there was a reason why I could believe in the Bible or Christianity. I knew I couldn't believe in Joseph Smith or Mormonism, um, but I wanted to know if I could believe in the Bible. And um, I went to Central Christian Church, and I went to the church library. And I told the woman that was there that I was coming out of Mormonism, but I had hard questions about the Bible and about Christianity, and there was a person that was returning a book at the time. It's called A Ready Defense by Josh McDowell. Oh. And uh, she says, you need to read this book. And um, I know we're running out of time, but... Well, no, there's a f about but, five minutes left. But so. for, uh, to make the story short, what Josh did for me is he helped me to understand the manuscript evidence for the Bible. That it was trustworthy. That it hadn't been changed or corrupted, that the yeah. original teachings of the prophets and apostles were not lost like I was taught in the Book of Mormon. Why are we told that in the church? I mean, we have <sighs> well, such an eighth article of faith and... You know, I, I hate to say so, something that's so simple, okay, but um, Joseph didn't believe the writings or teachings of the Bible, and so he needed a way to discredit. To discredit it. Yeah. And so he just said that the angel told him that it was done wrong. Yeah. Uh, and so from that point on, they there was this distrust yeah. for the Bible. And uh, it's not based upon evidence. I mean, I, I could not believe the overwhelming... I mean, as much evidence I found in church history that caused me to question Joseph Smith, I had mounds and mounds more, more. that showed yeah. the authenticity and the veracity of these uh, writings of the apostles and the prophets, and I began to believe that they, their words hadn't been lost over time. Then it was just a question, do I believe the story of the apostles? Do I believe yeah. that Jesus really rose from the grave? And, you know, for me, the thing, the testimony of someone who is willing to die for something that they believe is true has a lot of weight. Yeah. Um, I was willing to die for what I believed was right. Okay? Yeah, you were willing to, to, yeah, go ahead. I was willing to kill myself. And 
the apostles were willing to die. Now, what's fascinating is some people can say, well, yeah, well, there's a lot of people that are willing to do that. Even Joseph Smith did that. Okay? Well, that's true. But what we're asking the apostles to do is to die for something that they knew was a lie because they said that they had eaten with Christ, that they had felt Him, that they had spoken with Him. He had taught them things, and they saw Him ascend up into heaven. And they were so convinced that Jesus did all of these things that they believed He was God. Willing to die. And so they were not going to be out of that. And so they were willing when somebody gave them a choice. I'm choosing Jesus. I, you can kill me. I don't care. With our last little bit of time left, I know that you must have had a great uh, sense of relief knowing that Christ paid for your sins. Absolutely. What what has grace meant to you? Jesus' grace in the Bible is what I call crazy love, okay? <laughs> because it doesn't make sense. Uh-huh. I wasn't worthy. I met Christ... At, in the valley of my sin, I was almost ready to kill myself and do all of these things, and God forgave me there. He did not forgive me at the mountaintop of my righteousness where I was clean and holy. Yeah. He met me there and saved me. When you were broken. When I was broken and not worth crap. Yeah. Okay, That's where He loved me, and that intrigued me because a God who loves me, even though I'm not worthy of his love, deserves attention. And isn't that a great hope? Yeah. That every Latter-day Saint, every person should have, knowing that Christ has paid for our sins, and that through his righteousness, his grace, uh, there is nothing like the grace or hope that I had in Christ when I was a Mormon. There's a big question mark. Would I ever be good enough? Yeah. And I was always striving for it. But God gave it to me freely. The eternal life that I was seeking after, God gave me freely simply because I accepted it and believed in Him. And that's the greatest gift I have. Well, Andy, we could probably cover a lot more stuff. You're a concerned Christian, your Mm -hmm. outreach in Mesa. I know you are active down there and and representing. You speak around the country at different Mm -hmm. things. In fact, that's why you're up here from Mesa, to speak at a, a conference this weekend. So we really appreciate you taking your time to come up here. Thank you. Thanks very much. And we appreciate you watching tonight. We'll see you next week here on the Ex-Mormon Files. Good night.